What's going on guys? So a little bit different of a video. Um, I've been watching some uh, informational videos, one from SM Pratt, one from Poke Knowledge Cards. Uh, if you haven't checked him out, uh, he just got 4,000 subs recently. Uh, congrats on the subs, by the way. You make some really interesting points. Uh, his, uh, the video that I watched recently, 14 hours ago was posted, um, was talking about the low-hanging fruit of Pokemon. And, you know, I think, you know, everyone, everyone always hyping up and talking about the modern product. On one hand, in SM Pratt's video, he's saying Sword and Shield has really, really, you know, done a great job of taking this era of Pokemon to the next level uh, and really improving the hobby. Um, he's not blind to the redundancy of, you know, how many cards were printed or, you know, how hard it is to actually complete a set or getting an alternate art. You know, he makes, he makes those points clear, but he is right. Things are definitely going up a notch. They're going up a level. Um, so, but in Poke Knowledge's video, he's kind of talking about the, the low hanging fruit. Well, to me, that, that's, that's you know, the, the, the right on the money. I mean, he's, he's talking about people, you know, now just have to get these new sets that drop, you know, just have to go to their local GameStop or Target and pick up stuff, uh, and open up packs. Um, uh, and there's not a lot of hard research to that. I mean, I have a very large vintage collection and that took a lot of time and research and I'm still learning so much about it. I mean, Watsy era will always be the pinnacle for me personally because, you know, that's just what I grew up with. That is the blunt, most frank answer is that is what I grew up with. I'm, I'm, I was born in 1994. That's what I grew up with. And I didn't even really grow up with it. I was late to the game. I mean, I was growing up with EX series, mid-2000s stuff. That's the stuff that I had a chance to collect. And at that time... I just thought it was going out of style in comparison to WotC. As a little kid, I felt that WotC, you know, the cards that, you know, you could find in shops or in deals or on Craigslist, I was finding those to be a lot cooler looking, in my personal opinion, than any of the stuff that was coming out in the EX era, in the, you know, mid-2000s, early 2000s. Um, I just didn't feel like Pokemon was doing a really great job of uh, sculpting the hobby out to continuously grow. I thought they were kind of failing uh, collectors. Now, of course, stuff is worth a boatload now. If you had collected sealed product from the early 2000s, you would be swimming in money right now. But that's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make here is, you know, is it low-hanging fruit? Is the stuff coming out now low-hanging fruit? Um, you know, to answer that question, not in an argumentative way, um, not in a confrontational way, more so in just, you know, let's, let's address this because I opened a lot of packs when I first started doing YouTube videos and that was the low hanging fruit. It was the easiest thing for me to do, low cost, um, low damage to my bank account, but it wasn't really as fulfilling as finding this vintage stuff and knowing what was really valuable, um, and collecting that stuff instead. Um, I did it because from an investment standpoint, not a collector standpoint, from an investor standpoint, it made sense to buy this sealed product and collect it long term. Um, I know I don't normally do my videos like this. I'm on my way to the gym, but I really wanted to get some points out there. Um, the next thing is, you know, it's the same as it was in 1999. I know that's a broad statement, but it's the same it was then as it is now. You can either you can either be a collector and see what happens in the next 20 years, or you could collect now and the hype of everything and forget about it. There's a very good chance that people will collect stuff now and then later on just fall out of the hobby easily. We're going to have all this stuff, all this bulk of all these cards from these newer sets sitting around or going in the garbage, but that's still doesn't change the fact that people are opening this stuff at, at crazy insane, um, you know, rates that I, I think it's still going to really rise a lot in value. And by it, I mean, evolving skies, fusion strike, brilliant stars, 
Astral Radiance, I, I really didn't want to take a part in. I, I just, I wasn't, there wasn't anything that I felt crazy about that I had to have that set for. I know for some people, you know, maybe the, the Machamp alternate art was enough reason to go after that set. For me, it just wasn't. Um, Origins, it looks like it, it could be a good set. You know, there's this awesome Aerodactyl in there, but again, just not really my style. I like the classics and I like sets that cater more to the classics. And I felt like personally, um, Evolving Skies did the best at catering towards the older sets as well as um, Brilliant Stars because Brilliant Stars, you know, has the Charizards in it. Say no more. Charizard might not be the rarest card around, but it's definitely the card that most people are going to chase after. But Evolving Skies has such a unique differentiation of the type of cards that were alternate arts. You know, I think the Evolutions, for the most part, brought so much to that set because it, 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 it encompassed all these different types. Um, and then you have Rayquaza, which isn't Gen 1 or 2, but Sapphire and Ruby, that's what I grew up playing as a video game. So really like Swampert, Blaziken, uh, Sceptile, um, Rayquaza, Kyogre, Groudon, those were the biggest the biggest cards that you wanted to have for me. So to see some of that back in Evolving Skies, um, you know, I know you have Celestial Storm and you have Rayquaza and some of these other modern sets, but it's just, it was really exciting for me to see these cards in Evolving Skies and it was really exciting. Um, SM Pratt made a good point on that. The hobby, they are doing such a great job with all the hype that's happened in this hobby and all the people that are getting into it, they're doing such a fantastic job of keeping people happy, keeping those printers running. Um, but you know, to poke knowledge's point, um, I just, I think we are all doing the thing that's easiest. That's the most affordable instead of really trying to get to know the hobby from its roots, which nobody owes the hobby anything like just, just because I was, you know, born around a time that Pokemon became a thing doesn't mean that that's the only set that matters. That's just what I feel is personally um, just the best, the cream of the crop, anything that's WotC. And more recently, I've got into sets like Expedition, um, Aquapolis, Sky Ridge, because those are WotC too. Um, oh, I got to lock my car. Um, but truly, you know, I just... I think that these newer sets are doing the hobby justice, and I'm excited to stick in it for the long haul. Um, I, I, I really, I do feel like these sets are going to explode in value over the next couple years. Why am I thinking that? Yes, there is a ton of product out there. That is undeniable. But what's going to happen to that product? The same thing most likely that happened in 1999. I mean, people are definitely holding on to their Pokemon cards differently, but there's still going to be people, a lot of people in my life personally, that think Pokemon is a childish waste of time. Um, a lot of my friends, family, people that I care about, that I, I think care about me, um, they think that this is a waste of time being in this hobby. I don't. I think that it's the same thing you had in 1999. People are going to eventually fall out of the hobby, and it's only going to be the people that stick around and stay with it that reap all the benefits of this stuff going up in value. Not just that, but you know, I've noticed I don't always have to be buying stuff, but if I'm staying in the hobby and I'm constantly, you know, looking through the market, looking online, looking for deals, looking for stuff, you are going to find stuff if you're always looking for it, if you're sticking with it in the long haul. It's just like the stock market, which I have the same attitude with just stick with it in the long haul. I have two major investments in my life. One, a company called QuantumScape that I've been in all year watching it lose value. Still sticking in in the long haul, not selling a single share. The other thing that's my major investment, well, prob probably my cars, my house, but really it feels like Pokemon is the other investment. And it's not always gonna go up. Sometimes it's gonna go down. But for me personally, I'm just gonna stick with it in the long haul and see what happens because I believe that People are gonna open up all this stuff and it doesn't matter how much cards, it doesn't matter how many cards are still out there. 
that all that bulk laying around. What matters is how much stuff stays sealed. And I just don't think everyone out there has the, the willpower um, or the know, the know how and watching the market before and, you know, um, basically repeating, uh, repeating history, history repeats itself. I don't think people know enough about that or have the willpower, um, or, you know, knowing that in the long haul, hard sacrifice of holding on to this stuff over just wanting to open it to get that hype or that serotonin or get that content for YouTube. Um, in the long haul, being the collector and holding on to it, they are going to go up in value because there are going to be the few and the proud that are able to hold on to this, um, hold on to this product. And I think for the most part, the people that are holding on to this product are going to be distributors. They're going to be people that have connections with Pokemon. They're going to be big time collectors. They're going to be big YouTubers that have all that subscription, that have all that money coming in, they are gonna be, they're, they're gonna have all the product. Um, I'm reading a book right now, uh, uh, 12 Rules to Living Life Without Chaos, or something like that, it's by Jordan Peterson. Um, and I'm stuck on this one part right now, but I remember early in another chapter, it was talking about um, there, we are still living in a dominance hierarchy, right? It's the same in Pokemon cards. You've got a dominance hierarchy. You've got, you know, winner takes all. That is like the dominant lobster, you know, in the ocean or, you know, the dominant lion. They are going to take most everything. All that product out there, that's going to a few people in my opinion. The people that are rooting for the hobby the most, the people that have stores, the people that are trying to move product, um, the people that might get stuck with that product, uh, because they got too much of it and some of it's not selling like I know that when these sets are coming out Some of this stuff is just not going to sell um, But that doesn't mean that they're not still gonna sit on it happily as the years go by as the years go by most things As we see as time moves on we all kind of see this history repeats itself things go up in value Especially when they're kept in mint condition um, I really feel like you can't lose in this environment and this Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever you're into card-wise or collectibles, uh, I really think you can't lose if you just stick with it. Now, we don't know what's about to happen. There could be a major recession coming. Who knows what's going to happen with the stock market, with the world economy in general. Um, but one thing I know for sure, very few people are going to be able to hold on to their stuff when hard times are ahead. I am a very stubborn person. I, I almost never want to sell anything of mine. I've only started selling Pokemon cards to account for some of the money that I'm spending. Um, and that's growing and that's great. But you know, Poke Knowledge, thank you so much because you have reminded me what making content is all about. And it's these conversations and I can have a conversation all day. I would love to do a zoom call, you know, with another content creator at some point, but that, that doesn't matter right now. Um, what matters is getting you know my points out so that I'm not always making the same redundant content, which is exactly what you know Poke Knowledge is talking about, that low-hanging fruit of having new stuff come in. And I do feel like my videos talking about you know mystery Pokemon mystery mail day, the a big part of that is that you don't know what's gonna be there, and that's that's fun, that's interesting, that's different, that's unique. Um, I'm trying so hard to differentiate myself from other content creators, um, but one thing that I am not doing enough of is trying to have these conversations with you guys, um, whether it, it be live, if I did a live video or just did a short, you know, selfie video clip like this. Um, but, you know, I do want to get other people's thoughts on these newer sets. You know, um, I am someone that sees this as an opportunity to make money too, though. That is not, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't. Have I really made any money off modern Pokemon cards? No, absolutely not. I have lost money. I've spent money. I've dumped money. I've not even pulled the cards that I really wanted to pull. But that is the nature of you know collecting cards in this sword and shield era of cards. These sets are really big, but that doesn't mean they're not getting better. And that's what SM Pratt, he makes such a good point of that. Now, do I feel strongly because recently I got a case of Evolving Skies booster boxes? Maybe, I might be a little biased right now, but that's only one case. 
that's only one case. It'll be easy for me to sit on because I have other booster boxes that are sealed of Evolving Skies and Fusion Strike and Chilling Rain, Darkness Ablaze, Vivid Voltage, all those guys. I think they're all great investments and they've all gone up a little bit in value for the most part. But um, mainly it's that case of boxes that I have. Those are gonna go up a lot in value. And who has the most of those? People that have connections with distribution, people that have storefronts, um, or I guess you could say just say hardcore collectors. Um, but you know, that is kind of the low hanging fruit. But just because something, you know, seems easy and obvious doesn't mean it's gonna work. That's kind of the point I think Poke Knowledge was making, one of them at least. My take on it is, yeah, but all the time people say, well, I could have done that. Why didn't I do that? That's how I felt after, you know, getting back in the hobby a couple years ago and, and realizing that I had a lot of this product um, as a young kid. You know, I didn't have sealed booster boxes. I didn't have sealed packs, but I had a lot of these cards, a lot of that product as a kid. And I never, you know, would have known that it would have gone up in value like this. I think a lot of people were struck by that. But um, I think one of the biggest things is now we have a chance for those of us that were collectors in the past and that are getting back into the hobby. Now we have a chance to go back into this again and do it right. And this time I know that I have, you know, with eBay and with Mercari and with how easy and accessible the market is today, you don't even have to have a store near you, which that's a whole other video, brick and mortar, where brick and mortar is going. Is e-commerce going to completely overload brick and mortar? It's brick and mortar a thing of the past now. That's another conversation. I don't want to get into that because uh, that's another can of worms. But, you know, it's so easy and obvious, but we still don't do it. Happens with the stock market when prices are down. Happens with Pokemon cards. This whole past year, Pokemon cards were down. Prices were down. This year, I'm looking at the exact same vintage product, and some of these cards are twice as much. For example, today I was looking at a Sky Ridge. Um, oh, God. Why do I always forget Umbreon? No, it's, it's, the, it's the other one that I'm completely forgetting, the Psychic type. But the one I'm talking about is Umbreon. I was looking at a Sky Ridge. I think it was 31, H31 out of H32. Um, Sky Ridge holographic Umbreon artwork. I'm pretty sure I saw those last year for $200 max. Near mint conditions, $200, $220. Now they're going for $400, $500. Kids that have no feedback, that have never sold anything, are asking top dollar bubble inflated prices. This is the awful part of how hyped up Pokemon has gotten. That it's just so hard to get into it now in 2022. I think that something is coming. I think that there could be a recession possibly and Pokemon cards are gonna get hit, in my opinion, like anything else. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe they'll stay stable, um, but I really feel like if you just stick with it in the long haul, you'll see prices maybe come down on some of this stuff and you can get into it. I, that's for vintage product. For modern product, I don't believe that to be the case. You could get some budging on the prices, but I think for modern product, for the most part, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get people. You're gonna get a steady rise in the price of that stuff, just because you know it's brand new sealed product. For some of the vintage stuff, if it's sealed product, it'll probably hold its price. Okay, don't don't quote me on this. But if it's opened up product, if there's if it's used product, you know, like these raw cards, like the raw card that I'm trying to buy, and the kid wants four hundred dollars as a starting price for an Umbreon Hollow. I'm just not, I'm not buying into that. I'm not buying into the, that that's where the value is. I know some of these cards have values now that are in the thousands. A first, a first edition Charizard, you know, Blastoise, first edition Venusaur, those make sense to me to spend thousands on. But something like a Sky Ridge, a later set that came out that's still Watt C, but you know, an Umbreon Hollow, man, $400 near mint. You know, I, I'm sure in a nine or a 10, they go for a thousand, maybe 1500, but just seems like it's getting a little bit out of hand as far as the vintage stuff goes. So I'm kind of, I'm trying to pivot right now away from vintage to give vintage some time to cool off maybe, um, even though that could be a mistake. Maybe vintage is getting so scarce that the stuff is gonna go up in value. Anyways, I gotta get into the gym, guys. I've been ranting here way too long. People are looking at me like a crazy stockbroker person even though I'm talking about Pokemon cards the whole time. Anyways, 
Um, see you guys. Peace out. Thanks for watching. I hope someone found this my video rant informative. I'm probably going to be doing a lot more of these. They're really easy. It doesn't take a lot of time or effort. Might as well spew out my thoughts and see what other people think. Um, I think modern is going to go up. I think vintage is going to go up and may retrace a little bit. But um, I think it's a win-win either way. And if you're a collector, what difference does it make? You like this stuff to collect it. You don't necessarily care about the dollar value. And more and more, I am becoming a collector like that where I love this stuff and its value is kind of priceless to me. And I don't care where the value goes or if it's a bubble that's inflated right now. I just want it. Um, now, for other people that are strictly in it to try and make money, man, it's, it, it's going to be rough because single cards are just not fetching premiums like you would think. Um, unless they're alternate art cards, which are going for two, three hundred dollars or more. And those are so hard to pull that I'm not even the least bit surprised that they're going for those prices. For example, and I always point to this example because I did a ton of videos on this set. Brilliant Stars, when that came out, I went all in. I wanted that set so bad. I wanted that Charizard alternate art so bad. I wanted a Rainbow Zard so bad. I spent $1,200 or more opening packs and booster boxes, and I could not get that alternate art to save my life. So after that, I felt a little bit burned. I think if that's what you're going for, you should stick to, and this is from my personal experience, buy the single cards you want. Find them in mint condition with good centering. Find them on eBay, bid them up. If you lose, learn from that. Failure is also a success in a way because you learn something out of failure. You don't learn if you're constantly succeeding. Um, <coughs> but uh, my point is, uh, what, what is my point? What am, I, what am I finally trying to make here? Oh, don't be in it because you think you're that lucky kid that's gonna pull that perfect card. Do it because you enjoy the hobby and you're open to getting that card, but you know, you know the odds of it. You know the rates of the pull rates. Um, anyways, guys, have fun, stay collecting, and everybody has a certain way of collecting. I just feel like I'm on a budget and I'm learning now how to better collect when you're on a budget. You know, what, what to do with your sets. Maybe you shouldn't open them for content. Maybe you should just talk about the market and them as investments and just keep them sealed and have that sealed product and see where it takes you and just buy the single cards. I've spent too much time chasing single cards out of these newer sets and been let down and then I find that they're super cheap online and that it was less money than me buying a set. Now on the offhand, if you open booster boxes of newer sets, you will have a lot of cards. You will get a lot more cards which could lower your dollar cost averaging over time when that bulk stuff becomes valuable. But anyways guys, everybody has their preference. If you wanna let, let me know your preference on collecting, do you like vintage, do you like modern, are you sitting on stuff, are you ripping everything open? I wanna know these things because I think the majority of people are ripping through all these modern sets and that's why they're about to go up in value because it's just, they're just, they're gonna be scarce after two, three, maybe four or five years. I know there's plenty of XY Evolutions booster boxes on the market, but I'm even seeing those prices go up and those numbers go down of the listings. So I think if that's a six year old set, in six years when it's 2028, when it's 2028, I think a lot of these sets are gonna be three to $500, easily, easily. Especially big name sets like Evolving Skies. Anyways, guys, peace out. I appreciate you for listening. I hope you found it informative. Deuce, deuce.